Um, today I want to introduce you to the cryo electron microscopy with a little bit of history and I want to go through from electrons up to pixels through the 2D crystals and once I reach the pixels it's the workshop that you are working with. So first of all I'm happy to have electrons. Electrons have a mass and are interacting a lot with matter. And electrons have also a charge, and this is nice, and you can pilot them in the electron microscope. So here are some old sketch where you see that uh, incident electrons are going through the sample if it's thin enough, and can be used for making a lot of electron microscopy like SAM, STEM, and TEM. And at the right panel you see how they interact uh, closely with the atoms and you see that electrons that interact with other electrons are doing bad things. We don't like them. They produce x-ray or they change the energy of the atoms and they lose energy and they are inelastically scattered and they make blurring in the, our images. What we like are the unscattered electrons and the elastically scattered electrons which gets scattered by the nucleus. So actually at the end, when you get a, a, a density map, it's not really an electron density map, it would be either a matter map. When you go to 3D. So electrons, uh, you have to produce them. We use uh, actually field emission guns. You can get a highly coherent uh, electron beam and it gets accelerated at 300 kilovolt in this Polara machine. Here's, here you see how you bake the gun because you need a high vacuum to get electrons to travel through um, your, your uh, column. And I also found uh, here a table where you can see that the, the um, traveling of electrons through uh, matter depends on their acceleration tension. Um, in carbon, with a uh, 500 kilovolt or 250 kilovolt, it travels freely through uh, 3000 angstrom. So with 2D crystals, we are happy because 2D crystals are thin, and electrons would interact with these 2D crystals only, hopefully, one time. So. We can see that uh, in material science, and here is some images from coming from that Polara machine. When I try to correct the astigmatism, you can see that with very high magnification, you reach, uh, you see, start to see stripes. These are a mosaic of little graphite graphite crystals that uh, where these lines are separated by around three angstrom. So we get actually in material science to very high resolution easily. Also at right panel you see some gold. These are gold particles I, um, we can use to focus in, in other machines like in the stem. But if you go onto it with uh, high uh, coherent electrons and with uh, good machines you easily get uh, to see stripes and you actually see columns of atoms. You see, you have atomic resolution easily. But now we have biology. We are interested in biology, and the problem with biology is that every biological organism is in water. So we would like to have a structure of these organisms in or, or these particles in water. Problem is, in the good vacuum of the microscope, uh, there is no chance to get a structure of air-dried samples. Negatively stained, you have seen by Priyanka, she showed that we can preserve resolution up to uh, 15 angstrom, and you get some idea of the quality of your crystal if you use negative stain. But the ultimate high resolution things you would get with freezing. And um, historically, this after 50 years of, because first microscope came in the, in the 30s, and, and 50 years of dry microscopy uh, ended in the 80s with the um, idea that you could also look at frozen 
hydrated um, samples. And this historically uh, paper from Taylor from 74 showed that with hydrated catalase crystals you get electron diffraction to a good resolution um, when you use uh, the freezing. So freezing biological things is uh, well described in this old paper review from the Quaternary Review. Uh, this is a personal issue from Andreas Engel, he, he had since 98, and it's uh, Jacques Dubochet and colleagues that uh, are explaining how cryo-electron microscopy or vitrified samples can be done. And there is a lot to read in that paper. And at the right I have this uh, picture where um, different state of ice is uh, <coughs> imaged in a microscope with its uh, corresponding uh, power spectrum or electron diffraction pattern. Uh, I will go a little bit in this one. That water is actually a strange molecule that is making hydrogen bonds and can be linked to other water in, all direct, in, in that direction of the hydrogen. And this hydrogen bonding makes it very particular. And there are actually more than 12 crystalline forms of ice. But we are in our microscope interested in only three. The vitreous, which is not crystalline, the cubic and the hexagonal. And having hexagonal, cubic or vitreous ice depends mainly on the speed of freezing. If you cool with a high speed, you can get to this vitreous ice that has the same density as water ice. Hexagonal ice is less dense. Like you know, the icebergs are swimming onto the water. If you produce hexagonal ice in your sample, it will uh, first it will be black and it will not be nice for your object. Here you have an electron diffraction in the Titan cryos where you see these rings. This comes from cubic ice. This was a bad grid. And the cubic ice is, is well known at which a nanometer it diffracts. And you can any time by going on diffraction check the quality of your ice in the sample. You need grids. So I go a little bit through technical things. Uh, you can see that you can have different grids. Uh, mainly there are, um, you can have lacy carbon films on these grids. Or you can have an area of uh, holes with these uh, quantifold grids. And uh, every square has uh, one um, area with many holes. And in each hole you want to have your sample. You need carbon. Somehow uh, some people found out that to get a very nice carbon layer is important. And it's good to have it uh, from a vacuum that is made without oil. So we use a turbo molecular pump. And you use highly pure gra graphite or, or carbon that you evaporate on fre freshly cleaved mica. So mica is a mineral that you can split. And whenever you split the mica, you have a, a very flat surface that is very clean. And it's on this clean surface and the vacuum that you evaporate the gold, uh, the carbon. So after having the carbon on the mica, you want to bring it on the grid. And one way is to use a, 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 a petri with water and you can float the carbon off from the mica. And in this way, this is a little sketch, you can see that the carbon that was on top of the mica is now floating on the water. And you have two sides. You, you should remember that one is uh, very hydrophobic, the one that was in contact with air. And the other one that was in contact with the mica is actually hydrophilic and will even catch a lot of molecules. If you would do that on your sample, you would get a lot of floating. We'll see later that it can be useful. Here, you cannot really see, there is a very tiny, here, this is the edge of a, of a carbon that is very, very thin, like only 10 nanometer or 5 nanometer carbon. The grids are on, on, on the net and they are underwater. You let the water level down and the carbon gets to stick on the grids and then you take your grids and let them dry 
and use them later for the freezing. Oh, you, if your grids are dry and you want to bring a sample to the grid, the grid has to be rendered hydrophilic with the use of a glow discharge machine. In a, in a vacuum, a, a low vacuum, you can get with a, a high tension some glowing that will charge your grid, either positive or negative, depending if it's in air or in, in, a, in a polyamine or in a, I mean a medium like tantalum. Is. And then comes the plunge freezing. This enables to vitrify ice or water. If your sample is thin enough, the speed of freezing is so quick that it does not allow any nucleation or crystallization of the ice. You have no tactic, it means it does not have a phase separation that you would have pure crystals and your solute is pushed away and concentrated and getting high salt. No, everything goes like frozen in, in its state. So again, you use copper grids with a polycarbon film. You put your sample, it's again a fish. You blot away and you get it thin enough to get plunged in uh, liquid ethan. Ethan is used to cool your sample and ethan is cooled by nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. This is the old gu guillotine. This is, uh, I think, Henning designed also one of these machines. This one was designed by Ruhmann. So you have the, the, the grid on the end of the forceps. And you apply the sample and you plunge. So this is plunging. That's a guillotine, it goes quick, it goes into freezing agent, and then this is cooled by nitrogen. Nowadays we have a vitro pot, which all of you probably know. You can have a look on it at the Cicina. That vitro pot enables you to do the same thing, but with controlled humidity, controlled time and temperature and and blood force, and there you can set up a lot of things and do reproducibly your grid freezing. You want to use a, slur a slush of ethan, which is like here, when it starts to, to freeze, you stop cooling and you get this liquid ethan in which the heat is transferred very quickly and you can get this vitreous sound. Now you need to do a cryo transfer to the electron microscope. We have at CCNA three very good cryo electron microscopes, the CM200, the Polara and the Titan Cryos. Each of them can either take one grid, six grid or 12 grid. All are loaded in a cryo holder or a little cartridge and it, it is transferred better and better um, without contamination. You don't want the moisture of the air to condense on your sample. So. Once it's in the microscope, you have a quick look at low magnification to see if you have good ice. Here we have some hexagonal ice and some thick ice and thin ice and empty hole. The image of a 2D crystal would be with very low contrast, like completely gray. Here at 50K on a 200 kilovolt, uh, this was actually a detaching machine, detaching machine. You actually would only see spots if you do a diffraction, a uh, Fourier transform. This is the first exposure. When you go to the second exposure, you have a lot of contrast, but you lose a lot because you do really damaging the sample. So electron interact so much that they damage everything. So you, you, you see that one effect is, for instance, bubbling. And bubbling is not useful. Apart from these people that can publish in Science of 2012, the bubbling of the inside of a, of a bacteriophage. So here the bubbling is used to show where the, the matter sits, where this uh, structure in the head of the bacteriophage is sitting. But uh, actually radiation damage is a main problem in electron crystallography. 
radiation damage can be can do many things. So electron can when they hit a sample, they can do sublimation. So you actually lose water. Uh, I've read in the papers that what for for you lose um, for one hundred electron, you use one one nanometer of uh, water. You can have bubbling like it's depicted here. You can have drift because your sample is changing in the, in the shape and in the volume and everything. You can have radicals that are formed and radicals are chemically reactant to everything that is around and will rearrange and change your, your structure. And charging can occur and many things. So we have to find a way to, to minimize this and freezing and, and Cryo methods is is best way, and also low dose. So low dose imaging is a prerequisite. You absolutely need the low dose imaging and the cold temperature. So at, at liquid um, nitrogen temperature, 10 to 20 electron per oxygen square is um, recognized as a low dose or low exposure. If you go to helium temperature, you can increase a little bit the dose. But for sure, the first electrons are the best. In these 20, you should use only the, uh, the first 10 gives you the good information. Um, low dose means that you do not look at your sample for focusing. So you have different positions for focus at a different mag. And you take a low mag. And this is a way one can do low dose, you are all aware of. Uh, problem sometimes your grid or your carbon is not flat. This is a negatively stained image just to show you that the film of carbon can be wrinkled. You can also get these kind of images in a, with optical uh, microscopy, with reflected light uh, uh, optical microscopy. You can check your carbon. But uh, this wrinkling uh, will be dramatic for your 2D crystal if it sits on this. Uh, it will take all orientations. You would not have a zero tilt to uh, the crystals, but a, a wavy uh, crystal with different angles. And one solution would be first to use improved holocarbon film, like here, for a, which is more flat. I think these are the C flat grids. And you could also uh, think that the copper do you, that you use is shrinking. Uh, more than other materials in the cryo. Uh, and then you would use molybden grids that are better. Also, once you start to tilt your sample, you notice that, the, that, behave, that they behave strangely. And this is from Gyobu et al. You see that uh, tilted at 45 degree show a loss of uh, resolution perpendicular to the tilt axis. And is um, it thought that it is mainly due to charging and drift. And they describe in that paper that there could be an improved preparation of the cryoelectron grid to help. So it's so-called a sandwich technique. On, on that slide, you see again that the carbon film has been floated on top of water or buffer, and the grid is taking it from underneath, and that you later put it on a sugar solution, and finally you add protein, which is so-called back injection. And you remember the slide where I, I showed what is hydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic on the floating on water. You now go to add your protein to the crystals on that side of the carbon that, that only see the mica that is very flat and that is actually still wet from the beginning on and that will absorb a lot of, um, of your sample. Later on, they put the second carbon film on, on top to get it more symmetric, you can dry it out and get this famous carbon sandwich that can be freezed even in liquid nitrogen because it has this cryoprotectant of sugar embedding. 
Um, sugar embedding is explained here in methods in molecular biology, which is because it's mostly by Henning and Chu. And it has some uh, little tricks here, how also you can incubate in a petri where you have a humid atmosphere and you can keep your grid for more than 10 minutes or 30 minutes to let really your 2D crystal absorb to the uh, carbon. And sugar embedding is something that is uh, also explained here in the use of trehalose by the group of Tom Bals in this uh, review. Trehalose is a sugar um, that is actually also found in some little animals that let them dry out. Some animals like this uh, tardigrade can really dry out and survive for years as a dry uh, little beast. And it has been found that they are stuffed with 2.3% of trehalose. So trehalose is already used in nature. And here we just use it for our crystals. And this is a scheme how it explained that the sandwich method should help to get rid of the charging effect. So at left you have an asymmetric situation where you have only one carbon layer on your crystal and electrons get somehow not reflected well. And if you have a, a symmetric um, sample, you would get a, a help into getting less drift. Once you get to the microscope, you want to see something. You can look at the fluorescent screen. Here the electrons hit on the matter and, and you get some photons. This is direct uh, photons coming. This is one of the effects of the electron, but usually what we did is use films. So films are direct electron detectors. And here I took a picture from the cellar here in the biocentrum where we have this thing. This is a real zone. Uh, we don't think of poetry because we need to develop negatives. This was for years the work of the microscopist is to have an electron microscopy close to a um, dark room, Dunkelkammer. And the negatives have to be dry, the film has to be dry, they have to be developed, and there is a different procedure for high, uh, low dose. We you develop longer, you get signal-to-noise ratio that is acceptable. And once you have the negatives, you go to a laser diffractogram. You can check if you have spots. Okay. If you get astigmatism, you can reject plenty of negatives without even scanning them. Only the very good ones that diffract, that you are happy with, go to the scanner. So we still have this scanner at Cicina. It's a very good scanner. It's a prime scan. It is uh, able to scan 16 negatives. And you would uh, check the procedure. And for 2D crystals, you would scan at 2,000 lines per centimeter, which is a pixel of 5 micrometers. So I'm starting to tell about pixels. This is maybe a workshop. And um, you get one angstrom on the sample. <coughs> now, one possibility to avoid the drift and the charging could also be to use a spot scanning. This is a method also developed by Ken Downing. And it is the scanning of the 2D crystals with little areas. You would only take pictures of 100 nanometer in diameter and assemble them. So it's easy on a photographic film. You would assemble them and produce such an image. This is also from the review of Henning where he describes the spot scanning on aquaporin crystals. And it would uh, help to reduce the drift because you eliminate only a fraction of your crystal at a time. Now we have cameras. We don't need to develop anymore. The cameras can also get easily images that can be Fourier transformed, and then we can check immediately if we have crystals or not. These rely on a scintillator, so electrons are transformed in photons. It goes through fiber optics to the charge couple device, and it has to be cooled. And this is one screenshot of our camera at Polara where the, you see the beam size is just the size of 
Crystal. And now with the help of camera, we can even increase the low dose because you can take what's so called a grid map by taking uh, many pictures at very low mag and you can get an, an, array, an, an, an idea of your complete grid in, in, in a few minutes that you can then store and you don't look anymore at your grid. You can tie and stitch this image together and get the grid map and then you can navigate with the use of a calibrated stage you can navigate on this grid map to get to the region of interest and program and set and you, actually the microscopist is not turning knobs anymore but clicking with the mouse at the end of the day and with the help of that we plan also that you could do the spot scanning with dynamic focusing now if you have a crystal that is tilted you can set up positions of exposure and position of focus on parallel parallel to the tilt axis and you can vary your focus according to the height of the sample and you could get this way a spot scanning of a tilted specimen uh, from your camera. And this is close to the end. This is now the conclusion. I would say that for high resolution you need to be meticulous. That the sample preparation is of extreme importance. Of course, 2D crystals are the first bottleneck. You first get the 2 d crystals, but then yet there is a lot to do. And the charge induced specimen drift and lack of flatness can be solved plus minus by the sandwich method or by, the, by, by choosing good grid materials like this molybdenum. And the sugar embedding also helps to get the flat uh, carbon. And you can, re um, yeah, this uh, in addition, you could also do electron diffraction. But this is not described here and not, will not be used in this workshop. And for the radiation damage, it's very clear to use low dose, low exposure. And further on, you can use this spot scanning to reduce the charge induced drift. Now I'm finished with the talk and I want to thank the sponsors and our institution for letting me do this. If you have questions. Yes. Um, sometimes you know we when we collect the data in the uh, photo integrity center, we get an eyes some people refer as uh, reflected. Where is that what place is that in your lab? Uh, there is no the a tactic with will be what if you have a, a separation of phase between something that is crystalline, so your hexagonal or cubic eyes, and the, the remaining that actually gets concentrated and aggregated. So you have a tactic once you see such a net of, of, of ugly uh, sample that is not, that is expulsed, uh, that is thrown away from the crystals. So how do we if it's your vitrification didn't work. Um, I think this can happen if your sample is too thick on some parts. Then the freezing will not be optimal and you will have this ice formation and eutectic. And if your grid has a gradient on the other part of the grid, it would be thin enough to get the right thing. But when it's too thick, when you have too much material also, you can only go to a few micrometer uh, vitreous. Call it 
It's a remaining material. That one is amorph, but aggregate. Like the dry fish. Scaling, I think, was um, developed in parallel by Pat Willows, and he was in, in the MIT, and by Tim Downing in Berkeley. And Tim Downing also, um, so when we developed the PDX software in, in California, we were first with Tim Downing's lab, and we wanted to test data sets to try if we can actually do a full reconstruction fully automatically. We were looking for a perfect high resolution data set, and we asked Tim Downing for his two million data set, which he had recorded. Um, to determine the home structure of two balloons, the perfect home structure. So he gave us a pile of 80 um, micrographs and films, um, and we scanned them in. So we wanted to use the PDX software to automatically process them. And they were all pictures at 60 degrees slope, and none of them was at zero degrees slope, but they were all spot scanned, and all with a dynamic focus. So um, there were tongue rings over the entire micrograph that were all displayed, and one had no way of telling where was up and where was down. And we didn't know what the Union cell was, and so we, we couldn't find out what the tape geometry was. There was no tape axis visible in the micrograph. You know? And Tim Downing did this with spot scan with a microscope at 400 kilohertz without field emission done. And the micrographs were all absolutely perfect. They had tongue rings up to the nicest frequency, and they had isotropic diffraction in all directions, you know, like two million crystals, two million has a cell order and has a very high contrast because it's not a liquid membrane propylene, it's just a fluid propylene with gaps in between the two million strobes, propylene water, propylene water. And we couldn't process them because we didn't know where the tape axis was. But that was totally just with spot scan, right? done 15 years ago on a drill 4,000 or so, 400 kilohertz. And did they move the tongue rings? Um, he had maybe 10 by 15 spots on one polarco. Yeah. So a spot diameter of a tongue diameter seems fast. Yeah. In Frankfurt, I think, um, um, Bernd Schubert's lab uses spot scanning also with a static detail on a drill microscope. And so the, the problem if you if you focus your beam down to a hundred nanometer spot on the crystal, the problem is um, the illumination condition that you that you have error in illumination and not divergent or convergent, and when you then start shifting your beam. Then the problem is that you run into spins uh, as soon as you go away from the center axis. Um, and Anshu, you wrote an article about how to do a thinner field alignment. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that is the risk that, that thinner is then limiting your disease. The, the thing is that what I noticed is that in, in their case, they say, I say they do all the thin axis cases, they were tired of having to have a disease. So when, when we tried, There, there's four ways to determine the field geometry, and the best method is to just look at variations in tongue rings. This would then not work. But the other three methods still would work. So you can look in a set of distortions or comparing the tongue rings to the method of reconstruction or looking at. 
cost of the development of the So in the alternative research, you have to trust your home manager. If you know your manager so well and you know the project, he's always in this direction, and he's always positive of, of what I said, then maybe you know your system well enough that you can trust him. You could also, for calibration, once do it without dynamic pre-processing, then you know the build geometry, and then the rest of the session do with pre-processing. We have it on Friday. We have a demo of um, spot scanning on QCD with COVID testing or so at three o'clock. Let's see. Bring the data from the field lab remotely to the team field with kind of a Lara, right? Sorry, <laughs> 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 right.